Hello and welcome you all to another session of Beetle Biology. Today we are going to discuss about the NCRT 11th Biology Unit 1 that is diversity in the living world. So in this unit we are having four chapters that is chapter 1 the living world, chapter 2 biological classification, chapter 3 plant kingdom and chapter 4 animal kingdom. So these are the four major chapters included in the unit 1 diversity in the living world. So today we will be discussing about chapter 1 the living world in detail. So let's move on to that. So before moving on to the chapter you can see that there is a description given about Ernst Mayer. So who was Ernst Mayer? Ernst Mayer was an evolutionary biologist and he is known as the Darwin of the 20th century. So please mark that in your textbook. He is known as the Darwin of the 20th century. Highlight that point. It is an important point to remember. Usually it is asked in examinations. So in examination point of view, when a question is asked that who is known as the Darwin of the 20th century, it is none other than Ernst Mayer. So Ernst Mayer was one of the greatest scientists of all time. That is uh, 100 scientists who are the greatest scientists of all time. When we consider them, Ernst Mayer was one among them. So what were his contributions? His contributions were in different fields like ornithology, taxonomy, zoo geography, evolution, systematics and the history and philosophy of biology. He also pioneered the currently accepted definition of a biological species. So what is the biological species? Its definition which is currently accepted and followed by us all has been pioneered by Ernst Mayer. So these are the important contributions of Ernst Mayer. Ernst Mayer is an evolutionary biologist and he is known as the Darwin of the 20th century. So he is one among the 100 greatest scientists of all time and his subjects or research area spanned on subjects like ornithology, taxonomy, zoo geography, evolution, systematics and the history and philosophy of biology. So another important point here is he also pioneered the currently accepted definition of a biological species. So these are the points to be highlighted and learned. Now moving on to chapter 1. So chapter 1 is living world. So in the introduction part there is nothing much to read. It is just an intro to the chapter. So here you are introduced to the living world. As we know that living world consists of all the living organisms and the abiotic components. So living world. So what do you mean by living? So the first definition we are going to discuss is what is living? So how can you define living? So what are the characteristics or the distinctive features exhibited by living organisms? So as you all know, there are many characteristics that are distinct for a living being. So here the characteristics given are growth, reproduction, ability to sense environment and mount a suitable response. These are some of the characteristics that are distinctive of living organisms. There are also some other features that are distinct for living organisms. They are metabolism, ability to self-replicate, self-organize, interact and emergence. So highlight these points. These are important points that define a living organism. So a living organism has the following characteristics. And they are growth, reproduction, ability to sense environment and mount a suitable response and other features like metabolism, ability to self-replicate, self-organize, interact and emergence. So what is growth? 
so we know that all living organisms grow so how do you define growth so we can simply define growth as increase in mass and increase in number of individuals these are twin characteristics of growth so what are the twin characteristics of growth it is increase in mass and increase in number of individuals so in case of multicellular organism so multicellular organism grows by cell division so what is the method of growth seen in multicellular organism multicellular organism grows by cell division so multicellular organism as we know that plant plants and animals are multicellular organisms so in plants this growth by cell division occurs continuously throughout their life span so what is the difference between animal growth and plant growth is that in plants the growth by cell division occurs continuously throughout their life span but in animals this growth is seen only up to a certain age so there is cessation of growth in animals after a certain age you all know that after a particular age that is around 18 to 21 you guys stop growing in your height and all right in a similar way it is with other animals also there is a definite life span and in that life span there is a definite period of growth after that they won't grow there will be internal cell division and uh, uh, cell repairing and cell maintenance all going on but it will not increase in their mass and number that is the growth is only up to a certain age in animals but in plants this growth by cell division occurs continuously throughout their life span we have seen that trees used to expand and expand and expand they grow incessantly so the characteristic between that dif that differentiate between plants and animals in case of growth is that in plants the growth by cell division occurs continuously throughout their life span but in animals this growth is seen only up to a certain age so how unicellular organisms grow unicellular organisms also grow by cell division so in multicellular organism we said that their growth occurs by cell division similarly in unicellular organisms also their growth occurs by cell division so how can we find whether the unicellular organism has grown or not unicellular organism grow in the sense that they will increase in their individual cells that is they undergo multiplication from one cell they divide to form two cells and from two cells four cells so we can easily observe this in in vitro cultures by simply counting the number of cells under the microscope so in majority of higher animals and plants growth and reproduction are mutually exclusive events what do you mean by mutually exclusive events that is growth is a part of reproduction we have vice versa so these both the properties go hand in hand in majority of higher animals and plants growth and reproduction are mutually exclusive events so increase in body mass is considered as growth in the beginning itself we said that growth means increase in body mass and increase in individual numbers so increase in individual numbers is in the case of unicellular organism whereas in the case of multicellular organism it is the increase in body mass so increase in body mass is considered as growth so what about non living objects we know that non living objects also grow we have seen mountains boulders sand mounds and even clouds they used to increase in their size so can we consider it as a growth no it is not a growth but it is an accumulation of material on the surface so if we consider it as a growth then we can call it by another term that is extrinsic growth so what is extrinsic growth extrinsic growth means that the growth occurs externally so that is extrinsic growth 
so extrinsic growth is exhibited by non living things or non living objects so growth exhibited by non living objects is by accumulation of material on the surface this is known as extrinsic growth but in living organisms the growth is from inside and it is known as intrinsic growth so can we now consider growth as a defining property of living organisms now we are confused because growth we consider it for non living objects as extrinsic growth and in the case of living organisms as intrinsic growth so we cannot define living organisms with a particular characteristic known as the growth we have to consider other characteristics also only if growth is occurring we can't define a object or a thing as living or non living because growth can take place in living as well as non living in living it will be intrinsic but in the case of non living it will be extrinsic so what do you mean by extrinsic growth extrinsic growth is the growth that occurs externally so growth exhibited by non living objects is by accumulation of material on the surface whereas in living organism growth is from inside hence if this occurs in both we cannot define it as a property of living organism defining property not a property but a defining property if we have to define something we need certain characteristics that are particular for that only so this growth is not a characteristic that is particular only for living organism hence growth cannot be taken as a defining property of living organisms so if a question is asked growth cannot be taken as a defining property of living organisms define or explain how will you explain this question so here you have to consider growth what is growth you have to give the definition of that what is growth growth is the increase in body mass and also the increase in individual numbers in case of unicellular organism growth occurs by increase in individual number of cells but in multicellular organisms that increases by the growth occurs by increase in body mass by cell division and that occurs inside but in case of non living things also growth occurs that occurs by the accumulation of material on the surface that is known as extrinsic growth and in the case of living organism growth occurs from inside that is intrinsic growth since growth is characteristic can be seen in both non living objects and living organisms we cannot take growth as a defining property of living organisms so this is how we can explain the question growth cannot be taken as a defining property of living organisms so what are the other characteristics that we can take to define living organisms or what is living so we already said that growth and reproduction are two exclusive mutually exclusive events so mutually exclusive events means if there is growth there will be reproduction so if there is reproduction that will again lead to growth so these are mutually exclusive events so next property or the next characteristic we are going to consider is reproduction so reproduction is another characteristic of living organism so what is reproduction in case of multicellular organism in case of multicellular organism reproduction refers to the production of progeny possessing features more or less similar to those of parents so in multicellular organism what do you mean by progeny progeny are the other daughter cells or the next generation of organisms created by the parent so in multicellular organism reproduction refers to the production of progeny possessing features more or less similar to those of parents so you can understand this that for example a mango sapling 
that will grow and it will become similar to those of the parent mango tree so that is the multicellular organism production of progeny will possess features that is more or less similar to those of parents invariably and implicitly we refer to sexual reproduction so this can occur in the case of sexual reproduction so this is another method that is reproduction can occur either by asexual means or by sexual means so sexual reproduction a little variation can occur but in the case of asexual reproduction no variation will be observed so organisms that reproduce by asexual means include fungi so how fungi reproduce fungi multiply and spread easily due to millions of asexual spores they produce it is not that fungi cannot go for uh, sexual reproduction they can also go for sexual reproduction but they have dual modes of reproduction that is sexual and asexual modes in asexual modes what happens is that they produce spores and these spores when carried out by the air they spread easily and will lead to a uh, millions of asexual spores that will germinate into fungi so fungi multiply and spread easily due to millions of asexual spores they produce so consider lower organisms like yeast and hydra we all you all have already learned in your uh, lower classes how do yeast and hydra reproduce we know that yeast and hydra has a sexual mode of reproduction in which they go for budding so in yeast cell a bud will be formed and that bud will get detached from the parent cell and finally that will develop into a new daughter cell similarly in hydra we can see a bud forming on the parent hydra and that will grow for some time and then it will pinch off from the parent hydra and then it will grow individually and that forms the daughter organism so that is how asexual reproduction occurs in yeast and hydra and that method is by budding so what about in planaria in planaria or flatworms we observe true regeneration so how true regeneration what do you mean by true regeneration that is when the planaria is cut a fragment of that organism will regenerate the lost part of the body and becomes a new organism so true generation is found in planaria planaria is flatworm and you it has true regeneration and in the case of yeast and hydra we have a sexual mode of reproduction known as budding then fungi fungi produce asexual spores then there are also these fragmentation huh? fragmentation and regeneration that is fragmentation means a part of the individual will break down and break apart and that will again develop into the individual organism so that is known as fragmentation so fragmentation as a mode of asexual reproduction is observed in fungi filamentous algae and the protonema of mosses so the fungi filamentous algae and the protonema of mosses have another mode of reproduction known as fragmentation in this fragmentation what occurs is that a fragment of the individual organism break apart and that develop into a new individual so when it comes to unicellular organisms like bacteria unicellular algae or amoeba reproduction is synonymous with growth that is increase in number of cells will be synonymous with growth that is when amoeba increases in number it means that it is growing it is growing in the sense that new and new amoeba are being produced since amoeba is a unicellular organism similarly in the case of bacteria bacterial growth means that the bacteria is increasing in its number so unicellular organisms like bacteria unicellular algae or amoeba reproduction is synonymous with growth that is 
they increase in the number of cells. So as we have already defined growth as equivalent to increase in cell number or mass, we can correlate this with the case of unicellular organism as well as the multicellular organisms. So, we are discussing about reproduction. So, is it that all organisms reproduce? So, it is not necessary that all organisms reproduce. There are mules, sterile worker bees, infertile human couples, etc. that cannot undergo reproduction. So, hence reproduction also cannot be an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organism. Why reproduction cannot be called an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organisms? Because there are organisms that cannot reproduce like mules, sterile worker bees and infertile human couples which are not capable of reproducing. Hence, reproduction cannot be considered as an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organisms. Here we can say that non-living object is not capable of reproducing or replicating by itself. So there is no doubt that non-living organism can be included in the characteristic feature of reproduction. Can non-living objects reproduce? No, definitely not. They cannot reproduce. How can they reproduce? But in the living organisms itself, there are certain set of organisms that are not capable of reproducing. So, we cannot consider reproduction as an all-inclusive part. So, reproduction cannot be an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organism. How can we say that or give reason? Because Though reproduction is observed in all unicellular and multicellular living organisms, there are certain group of organisms or set of organisms that cannot reproduce. Examples are mules, sterile worker bees and infertile human couples. Hence, reproduction cannot be an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organisms. So, let's consider the third characteristic that is metabolism. So, what is metabolism? Metabolism, as you know, that it consists of two different steps that is anabolism and catabolism. So, what is anabolism and catabolism? Anabolism is the process in which new molecules are being produced. Simple molecules combine together to form a complex molecule that is known as anabolism. Whereas in the case of catabolism, what happens is that the complex molecules are being broken down into simpler molecules to release energy. So in anabolism, energy is being used to create complex molecules. Whereas in the case of catabolism, energy is released while breaking down of the complex molecule to simpler molecules. So, all living organisms are made of chemicals. So, these chemicals are known as biomolecules. So, these chemicals may be small and big and they belong to various classes, sizes and functions. So, these are constantly being made and changed into some other biomolecules. Can you name biomolecules? Yes, the biomolecules are carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, etc. that are found in our body. So, these are biomolecules which are synthesized in the body or being broken down in our body. So, these conversions are chemical reactions of metabolic reactions, the processes which lead to the synthesis of biomolecules or the breakdown of biomolecules are known as metabolic reactions. So, there are thousands of metabolic reactions that occur simultaneously inside all living organisms. So, be it be unicellular organism or multicellular organism. So, metabolism is a characteristic feature and it occurs in all type of organisms. Even plants, animals, fungi and microbes exhibit metabolism. 
the sum total of all the chemical reactions occurring in our body is metabolism so what is metabolism it is the sum total of all the chemical reactions occurring in our body no non living object exhibits metabolism as we said in reproduction that no non living object can reproduce the similar way no non living object can exhibit metabolism so metabolic organ reactions can be demonstrated outside the body in cell free systems an isolated metabolic reaction outside the body of an organism performed in a test tube is neither living nor non living hence while metabolism is a defining feature of all living organism without exception isolated metabolic reactions in vitro are not living things but surely living reaction hence cellular organization of the body is the defining feature of living life world or life forms so metabolism we can perform metabolic reactions in a test tube but that that is not a characteristic feature of non living it is still a characteristic feature of the living organisms so we can say that cellular organization of the body is the defining feature of life form so the, for the first time we got a def, defining property that is cellular organization of the body is the defining feature of life forms now another complicated feature of all living things is the ability to sense their surroundings or environment and respond to the environmental stimuli that can be physical chemical or biological so response to stimuli how the living organisms react to a particular incident so the ability to sense the surroundings or environment and respond to the environmental stimuli which could be physical chemical or biological is another defining property of living organisms so how do we sense our environment obviously we sense our environment through our sense organs and how do plants respond plants we know that they respond to light that is water tropism then they react to the presence of water that is they extend their roots towards the uh, area where water is present that is known as hydrotropism then temperature that is the thermotropism then pollutants etc okay so all organism from the prokaryotes to the most complex eukaryotes can sense and respond to environmental cues photo period effects reproduction in seasonal breeders both plants and animals so that is another topic known as photoperiodism that we will learn later so that is also something that is related to the environment that is the surroundings whatever changes that occurs in the surroundings that in turn affects the reproduction of certain seasonal breeders like plants and animals then all organisms handle chemicals entering their body so there are also responses or changes occurring when certain chemicals are being introduced into the body for example when uh, pollen is introduced into the pollen tube what happens there is certain chemical reactions occurring there that will definitely lead the rupture of that pollen and the release of the sex cells into the pollen tube which finally will get into the egg get, get into meet the egg cell and finally result in fertilization similarly certain chemicals that enter our body we will be having certain sort of reactions so self consciousness so consciousness becomes the defining property of living organism we can give a single term for all these that is the ability to sense their surroundings or environment and respond to these environmental stimuli which could be physical chemical or biological 
you can give a single term for that that is consciousness so consciousness becomes another defining property of living organisms so there are certain exceptions also that is when uh, we are supported by a uh, certain life support system the whole body will be in a dead condition but the, the person may be brain dead that this body may not be functioning at all in that case there will not be any self consciousness or for before a surgery when you are giving a, given an anesthetic drug you will be in anesthesia so in that condition also there is no response so these are certain conditions that are uh that doesn't match to this property but that we can neglect because it is not a characteristic feature of that is not a, a normal condition so nor we have to consider only the normal condition so consciousness can definitely be considered as a defining property of living organisms so last and final property is that the ability of emergence so what is emergence so cellular organelles are not present in the molecular constituents of the organ but arise as a result of interactions among molecular components comprising the organ so what are organelles organelles are compartments present inside the organelles are components present inside the cell so how are these organelles formed organelles are formed as a result of molecular interactions there are interactions among the molecular components so these interactions result in emergent properties at a higher level of organization so what is emergence emergence is that certain cellular organelles the cellular organelles are not pr present in the are not present in the intact form so how they are formed the the cellular components are formed by interactions among the molecular components so interactions result in emergent properties at a higher level of organization so therefore we can say that living organisms are self replicating evolving and self regulating interactive systems capable of responding to external stimuli so how can you so how can you define that is living organisms are self how will you define living organism living organisms are self replicating evolving and self regulating interactive systems capable of responding to external stimuli so these are the important features of living organisms so next topic is diversity in the living world that we will discuss in the next lecture so thank you for listening hope you all understood if you have any doubt regarding this session you may uh, contact me you can text me or you can message me hope you all understood thank you